So uh, today's session, uh, session is going to be titled Becoming a Pharmacist in the United States of America. Um, today, it's, uh, it's going to be me. My name is uh, Sam Samor. I'm a pharmacist and board certified in the pharmacotherapy specialty. And you have my email showing on the slide as well in case you had any questions for me personally. Uh, that's relating to the topic that we'll be discussing today. So in the session today, we'll have a couple of different domains to uh, touch base on. Uh, these domains we've selected carefully at Albertinius for the reason is those are the most common questions that we find most of the students or candidates want to have answers for. The first discussion and the most common questions that we receive from students across the globe is the pharmacy market in the US. Uh, and obviously for us, we always recommend for the students uh, since moving to United States for a lot of individuals, it might be a big step, probably one of the biggest steps that they're gonna do in their uh, professional life. We ask them to understand the current trends so now we will go ahead and start looking at a couple of the numbers. Uh, I know that, especially across the social media, we have a lot of uh, people, everyone is sharing their own opinion or their own experience. Uh, but for us, we're, we have sources, we have numbers, we have statistics that we believe in. And those are going to be very important because we cannot evaluate or formulate a, an opinion about a, a certain decision when it comes to your career or professional life based on just emotions and one, or one person's experience. So we access the Occupational Employment and Wages Report. Uh, these uh, statistics are the most up-to-date. They were launched in 2019 by the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. So the U.S. government have their own bureau or an office that does a lot of the statistics or the numbers that has to do with the job market in the United States. So uh, the first thing we want, we're going to discuss based on the information and the number that they provided are the industries with the highest level of employment and the uh, pharmacist occupation. So these numbers that you guys looking at the slides are the three highest um, industries that as a pharmacist, you can possibly work in. The first domain or, or industry is the health and personal care stores. If you live in the United States, um, one of the examples are Walgreens or, C or CVS. So 133,000 Pharmacists work in the health and personal care stores across the United States. Their average pay per hour is $59. Um, that's hourly for the pharmacist position. After that industry comes the general medical and surgical hospitals. Uh, basically, anywhere you work in a, a hospital, whether you work as a staff pharmacist or a clinical pharmacist, for across United States in 2019, there are 77,000 pharmacists who work in these industries and their average pay is $61 per hour. And then we have the food and the beverages stores and those would come in as the third industry and um, it's about 24,000 pharmacists who uh, work in that industry and their average pay is $61. Some of the examples of these stores are, again, if you live in the United States, includes uh, Safeway, ShopRite, Stop and Shop. So it's basically the stores that they're mostly grocery stores, yet they have a little pharmacy department. So if you work there, you're gonna be considered among that industry and the, the total number of pharmacists who work in such stores are 24,000 pharmacists. 
And these statistics are across the United States. Now, industries with the highest level of employment in the occupation in terms of uh, a more focused or look at the uh, industries that we've mentioned before. So you will see that the outpatient care centers, uh, they have 6,000 pharmacists and the outpatient care centers is basically a pharmacy that belongs to a healthcare system or a hospital but they see not the patients that are admitted in the hospital. They deal with the patients who are taking prescriptions and leaving. Um, and their average pay is $68 per hour across the United States. And then we have the management of companies and enterprises. So pharmacists who work in managerial positions and the bigger corporates uh, in the corporate offices. And that's, uh, that's one of the things that we need to understand is you can work, for example, for Walgreens, which is um, a pharmacy store. You can find it on every or almost every corner around the United States. So you, you're considered to be um, a retail pharmacist. However, if you work for Walgreens, yet yeah, you work in an office setting in one of their corporate offices, you're gonna be considered to be working in a managerial position or in the enterprises. Across the United States, we have tw almost 2,600 pharmacists and their average pay is $63 per hour. And again, these numbers are average across the country. So obviously you will see people who might be getting paid a little bit less than these numbers who work in these positions and you're gonna have people who make way more money than that. Now, looking at the geographic profile for this occupation by state, um, we have a full look at the United States and it's divided by states. The four states that we have them highlighted uh, on the map, we have California State, we have Texas, we have New York State, and we have Florida. And the reason why those four states are uh, highlighted or circled is because these four states combined are considered to be the leading, um, the leading uh, employers for the, um, the occupation of pharmacists. So the numbers of pharmacists that work in these states is huge. And um, it's been reported as those are the top four states that have pharmacists employed within them. And obviously besides those four states, you're gonna find states that has a lot of pharmacy uh, positions that are filled. Uh, obviously we have New Jersey that's not circled on the map uh, because it, the, it's not among the top four, but still there's a huge number of pharmacists. Illinois State is the same thing. Michigan State is the same thing. Uh, Arizona State as well. So about those four states, which is the California, the Texas, Florida, and New York, state those are the four leading states when it comes to pharmacy or pharmacist uh, employment and jobs now for us we we discussed by state now we will discuss areas so areas is basically like bulks of a couple of neighborhoods and keep in mind that this, this doesn't necessarily have to be by state the reason being is, for example, when you look at New York and New Jersey and even some parts of PA, they're almost within a radius of an hour or two hours. And that's why we, uh, we consider them to be one bulk area. So if you look at the map of United States in terms of areas, the leading area that has uh, the majority of pharmacists working in there, it's gonna be the area of New York Newark, which is in New Jersey, Jersey City, which is in New Jersey as well. So New York, Newark, Jersey City, um, this area particularly, in 2019, they had 21,000 pharmacists working there. Their average uh, or, uh, pay per hour was $58. Next, we have the Los Angeles, Long Beach, California, the employment in that area alone was 13,000 pharmacists in 2019. 
and their average pay was $68 per hour. Third, we have the Chicago area in general. We have the Naperville and in Indiana and, uh, and Wisconsin. So basically it's an area of a radius of two to three hours. Their employment alone was 9,000 pharmacists and their uh, average pay per hour was $59 per hour. Next, we have the Philadelphia, Camden and uh, Wilmington. Those, which is basically you're looking at, uh, if, you, if you're familiar with the map of New Jersey and PA, this is technically the Southern area of those, uh, those states. And uh, their employments was 7,800 uh, pharmacists and their average pay was uh, $60 per hour. And finally, this, uh, the fifth leading area in the states that hire pharmacists is the area of Dallas, Fort Worth, and Arlington, Texas. And their employment is 6,800, which is 6,800 pharmacists in 2019. And their average pay is $57 uh, per hour. So why did we share the trend with you here? Is the reason being is we want to show you that there is a lot of positions okay and those positions for the most part are filled but keep in mind that there is tor turnover and what that means is uh so when i look at the first area which is uh, new york and newark and we say we have twenty one thousand pharmacists working in this area what it means is there is higher number of pharmacists so obviously people are going to be retiring people are going on vacations uh, and that tells you there's 21 positions, not necessarily just pharmacists. You want to look at the position or the opportunity. And what that means is there is more business happening that's needing more pharmacists in this area. So obviously, if you're planning out and you haven't decided which state to live in or emigrate to, then uh, you want to look at these numbers and look at these areas. But keep in mind, usually the highest areas in terms of the occupation means that there are uh, a concentration of pharmacists coming in looking for jobs so th that means it's heavily populated with pharmacists and that tells you it's going to be harder not impossible but harder to get a position there uh, but at the same time if you can get a position a lot of pharmacists we work with they know a relative and work, working in a hospital or somebody who owns a pharmacy or somebody who's a pharmacy manager who can get their foot in the door in big establishments. And those are very important because it can build your experience and it can uh, provide you with huge exposure. So one of the things that we recommend for pharmacists is if you can find your way into one of these areas, this is perfect, especially when it comes to internship. I know internships can be hard to find. They're not as easy, yet at the same time, if you can manage to get an internship in one of these areas, it's important. Why? Because there's more business, so that tells you there's more exposure. So for every eight hours you're doing, instead of you looking at 100 patient profile, you're looking at a whole lot more. So you're learning more. And obviously, once you become a pharmacist, it's completely up to you. You can move or go wherever you want, but especially in the period of the internship, because that's where you gaining a lot of the knowledge, these areas can teach you like nothing else. So it's important to, if you can, get into these areas because it's, um, there is more competition, but yeah, there is uh, different mentalities, different businesses, so you will learn more. Now, we discussed the positions that are available in the uh, country through different sections and sectors. Uh, the question is, okay, well, we, if we wanna consider the market, well, we wanna look at how many pharmacists actually graduate in United States per year. So our average pharmacist here who became a pharmacist is uh, 15,000, all right? So uh, in, uh, this was in the year of 2018 to 2019, almost 15,000 pharmacists became pharmacists 
who went to school inside the United States. Um, the 2019 and the uh, 2020, we're averaging around the same number as well. So obviously, if we say that the, the, uh, the bulk of the market is 267,000 pharmacists employed across the country, then you're looking at, um, and then you have 15,000 that's coming from the pharmacy schools within the United States. So this to kind of develop uh, a good image, how the market works in terms of supply and demand uh, for the pharmacist within the country. So now, once we looked at the market, uh, we want to look at the process to kind of look at the big, uh, the big picture of how to obtain or go after becoming a pharmacist in the United States. So first we have what's known as the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy or the NABP. And so this association of boards of pharmacy, uh, each state has their own boards of pharmacy that's considered to be the legislative power for the pharmacy practice within the state. It's true we have a federal government, but the federal government, uh, especially when it comes to the pharmacy practice, they have their own laws that you have to, uh, you have to follow, but at the same time, each state have their own board of pharmacy that legislate or regulate the pharmacy practice. And in the United States, every time the state has a different law than the federal government, which they tend to do that quite often, you will have to go with the state law, not the federal law. Now, so we have the states for each state, we will have um, a board of pharmacy. All these boards of pharmacy, they have an association. It's called the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy. Um, and this association is who gives out the licenses to become a pharmacist, or if you wanna do your foreign pharmacy uh, equivalency process. So for, for those of you who already applied with the, um, or to take the FPGE, then you know that the NAPP is the regulating body that you have to go through set for the FPGE. So uh, a department or a subdivision of the NAPP, it's called the FBGEC. And the FBGEC stands for the Foreign Pharmacy Graduate Examination Committee. Um, so you go to uh, the NAPP and you're basically applying or starting an application with the FPGEC. And that way you evaluate your documents so they can let you sit and take the test that will eventually lead you to becoming a pharmacist uh, in the United States. Now, for you to be able to um, be eligible to take the FPGE, you have multiple um, requirements that you have to tick off. In terms of the education, so prior to January 1st, 2003, uh, you have to at least complete a four-year pharmacy curriculum at the time of the graduation. If you graduated after 2003, then you will have to complete at least a five-year pharmacy curriculum at the time of the graduation. One of the most common questions we receive is, okay, what if I graduated after 2003, but my pharmacy program was four years or I finished in four and a half? So um, it depends. A lot of times if you had, if you have master's or you obtained a master's degree after your bachelor's, then if it, if it has to do with the pharmacy practice or the clinical pharmacy practice, then they would let you sit for the FBGE or if, you, uh, if it was four and a half years, and the reason why it was four and a half years is because you took too many credits during the summer, then they might waive it and let you, uh, let you go ahead and uh, apply for the FBGE. Okay, so for next, besides education, uh, you have the license. So you must be licensed in either the country where you have graduated or the country where you were a participating pharmacist. Uh, and that what that means is, 
So you either have to be show that you've been licensed in the country that you went to school, or if you've been licensed in a different country. Uh, so for example, let's say you're in terms of nationality, you're, you're Algerian and you, for some reason you went to school in France. So uh, you either have to show them that you went to school in France and you became licensed pharmacist in France, or you went to school in France and you came back to Algeria and then you registered to, uh, and became licensed in the, as, a, as a pharmacist in Algeria. Uh, so the bottom line is you have to have a pharmacy or a pharmacist license somewhere before you apply in to become a pharmacist in the United States. Um, the good thing is about the NABP is sometimes if there is um, specific circumstances that stood between you and you becoming a licensed in the country you went to school uh, to become a pharmacist, then they might waive it. But usually these decisions are made on case by case basis. So uh, it's worth the shot to reach out to them to see if, uh, if that's something you might be uh, qualified for. And then nowadays, uh, when it comes to TOEFL, so we just received a uh, question um, in the chat. So what I'm gonna do now, we will, uh, at the, towards the end of our session, we're gonna go ahead and uh, answer all of the questions that you will submit over to us. Um, that way we just uh, maintain the flow of the, uh, of the session. Then I will address as much as I can from the questions you guys sent over to us in the chat. Third, which is a new requirement that we have is uh, the TOEFL. So before 2020, they used to let you take the FPGE and the second step is the TOEFL and the FPGE and the TOEFL together, it's gonna to be considered that you have the FPGEC, uh, which allows you to become an intern and take your NAPLEX and finish or end the law test and become a pharmacist. However, starting off 2020, it became a requirement to actually pass the TOEFL first, then take the FPGE. And um, with the TOEFL requirements, as of 2020, you have a reading that you need to score 22 out of 30. In your listening, you have to score 21 out of 30. And in your speaking, you have to score 26 out of 30. And your writing, you have to score 24 out of 30. All of these scores has to be uh, accomplished or achieved in one session. And what that means is, let's say you go ahead and you test today and um, you score everything except your speaking, you score 20 out of 30. You cannot just go to the second session and just focus on scoring more than 26 in speaking because they will not accept it. All four domains or sections has to uh, have the minimum uh, or the minimal uh, accepted score for you to consider that you have passed the requirements for TOEFL to be able to set for the FPGE. And if you guys do any research on, uh, in the market, or if you speak to anybody who became a pharmacist or trying or going through the process, you will know when it comes to TOEFL, it's the rate limiting step for the process. A lot of us, they can do the reading and the listening from the first try or the most of us. But when it comes to speaking and writing, those are a little bit um, evaluated differently than what you think. They're evaluated because the TOEFL at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's more on the academic proficiency. And what that means is just because you listen uh, to American music or just because you watch uh, sitcoms or you have Netflix or you go on YouTube, that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, you can meet their required uh, speaking score. And unfortunately, we see a lot of students that they, uh, they try to offer 22 times or 25 times, and yet they still haven't uh, achieve the required score with the speaking. And the reason being is because for us, especially as people of science or pharmacists, uh, we're used to open a book, 
memorize it, understand it, go to the test, do well at the test and move on. But when it comes to the TOEFL, the TOEFL is a language and the language is a skill. I can give you 15 references for English, but at the end of the day, if you didn't practice your language, you're not gonna meet the required score for TOEFL. So uh, later on, we will dive deeper into how to prepare for the TOEFL. But for now, my advice to everyone, even if you're not taking your test in 2021, even if you're taking it in 2022, start building your speaking and writing uh, academic English uh, proficiency from now because it's going to take you a while to build it up to meet the, the minimal required scores that's needed for you to sit for the FBGE. Okay, so here we have a quick flow uh, chart to indicate the several steps that you're going to have to go through uh, to register as a pharmacist. So your first step, we're starting from the bottom and working our way up. The first step is you need to submit an application with the ECE uh, and obviously uh, pay the appropriate fees. So the ECE is the body who's gonna look at your credentials to decide if whatever pharmacy program you were enrolled in meet the minimal required curriculum that the uh, NAPP requires for you to become a pharmacist in the United States. So uh, if you go to ece.org slash NABP and share, um, you can check on the requirements, what they ask for you. Um, and they obviously will ask you to submit all of your credit hours and degree, and then they will evaluate it. And th then they will send uh, the NAPP telling them that you're either eligible or you're not eligible uh, to become a pharmacist in the United States based on that alone. So after the ECE, we have the FPGC application. Uh, usually you're gonna start, you can do that by going to the NAPP uh, profile and start the application process. So once you take the, uh, or once you apply for the FPGC, uh, your third step that you will take is the two tests. First, you will have to take the TOEFL. Next, you will have to take the FBGE. Um, obviously, for a lot of the pharmacists now, they apply to uh, the NAPP before 2020, and they still have their profiles active. So those, they don't have to take the TOEFL first. Uh, but for everyone, for all the newcomers who's gonna, who applied after January 1st, then you will have to take the TOEFL, then the FBGE. And uh, after the third step, the fourth step, it gets a little bit tricky. So if you guys remember when I said that each state has their own requirements, they have their own boards of pharmacy, they come up with their own regulations. Uh, and that's what makes the fourth step a little bit unique. The reason being is some states allow you to start counting your internship hours before you have the FPGEC. And some of them would even let you take the third test, which is the NAPLEX or the law test before you finish your internship hours. So depending on the state that you decide to go to or you have your mindset to move to, then you will, uh, you need to find out what's the plan for them, what they decide on or what's the preferred way of doing things. But the first step combined, you will have to do internship hours, the number of hours uh, it change, uh, it's different from one state to another, but the average hours that you need to do as an intern are about 1200 hours, which is a good six to eight months, depending on how many hours you work per week. A lot of uh, pharmacists who practiced overseas and they come here and then they look at these requirements and they get really mad. Oh, I have to be an intern for six or eight months before I can actually go ahead and become a pharmacist. Um, I had the same mentality when I first started, to be honest, but after I did my internship, the thing that you need to focus on is in the United States, things are different. Uh, so no matter how good your school were and no matter where you went to school, they did not teach you how things work in the United States. 
uh, in the United States, our healthcare is heavily regulated, which means is if you make one mistake, it might cost your license. If you do a thing, it might cost you your employment. Um, and the, the domain or the range of uh, medications that you'd be dealing with, it's quite different. I mean, we know a lot of pharmacists who work in separate, uh, in um, specific countries, they can, they can be a pharmacist for 10 years, but all the medications they worked on are just a couple of antihypertensives and a couple of diabetic agents, and that's it. But once you become a pharmacist here, you even if you work at Walgreens, some of the medications you're going to be dealing with are oncology medications, uh, AIDS medications, antidepressant medications. And a lot of these meds, they can cause a uh, huge impact on the patient life if they were dispensed incorrectly. So... Um, after seeing how things work here, we definitely recommend that the internship is something that you have to do and you have to take very seriously because uh, it's what makes you a pharmacist. And keep in mind that the day you become a pharmacist, if you were lucky, somebody is gonna be there to train you. Um, some employers, they might have another pharmacist work with you the first couple of days so you can learn how the system works with it, where whatever you work. But for the mo most part, once you have your license that you're a pharmacist, you're ready to go. So some of the pharmacies I know, they start you on day one. Once you, um, once you become a pharmacist, they interview you, they tell you everything is good. Okay, start tomorrow. You start tomorrow and you're on your own. So uh, it's important for the internship for you to actually do it. Uh, I know sometimes they say, oh, we'll just find a quiet place where they don't see a lot of prescriptions, so uh, you don't have to work as hard. Well, that's incorrect, too. The reason being is the more work you do, the more exposed to things and uh, problems, and you will develop a leadership skills, which you are as a pharmacist, especially in, in the United States. Once you stand as a pharmacist in the pharmacy, you're going to be considered to be a leader. If anyone have an issue they will ask about a pharmacy manager or a pharmacist. So if the pharmacy manager is not working that day, guess what? You're going to have to deal with the issue. And that's why as an intern, you will have to take it very seriously. After the internship, we have the NAPLEX, which is uh, the clinical science of pharmacy. Um, and then we have the uh, multi-jurisdiction exam, and that's or the law test. Um, or the MP, uh, MPJE. Uh, so again, United States is very regulated when it comes to healthcare. So one of the things that you have to pass is the specific state's law when it comes to pharmacy practice. So you will not only need to do or know the clinical aspects of things, you need to know management, you need to know healthcare, how healthcare system works in general, and you need to know the law behind the practice of pharmacy because you need to know how, uh, how can you break the law and you wanna avoid that. The things that you're not supposed to do, the things that you can do, how to help the patient within the uh, power that you were given by the State Board of Pharmacy. So these are the four steps that if you start from bottom to the way up, uh, usually, in average, it takes about 18 months to two years, depending on how well you can do things and how well you're prepared. Uh, and then you become a pharmacist in the United States. Third, we will go uh, over how to study and how to have a plan to target each step of the way. So uh, just disclaimer, in today's session, we're not diving deep on how to study. We will just go in over couple of uh, quick bullet points and that way uh, we make things easier for you and hopefully later on we will have the time to dive in deeper. So we have TOEFL, FBGE and third we have NAPLEX. The reason why I'm not discussing law tests because each state is different and uh, if we will have if we're going to speak about every state then it's going to take us a couple of months. The first step is the TOEFL. So as I said, TOEFL, TOEFL is a language. A language means it's a skill. 
and skill needs time for it to be built up. Um, so the first thing you wanna focus on, no matter whatever reference you use when it comes to the TOEFL, you wanna practice. So again, whether you study from YouTube, you know, a 10 year old book that you found on somebody's shelf or you found in a library or you're following a specific tutor on social media or you're going to language centers in your school. You wanna make sure that you practice. And by practice, I mean you practice in listening, reading, speaking, and writing. Uh, don't just read things and assume things are good. No, you wanna practice everything. And then the next step is you wanna assess. And what I mean by assess, you wanna evaluate. So your assessment is not by taking a couple of multi-choice questions and free quizzes online and assume, oh, I'm doing well because I'm passing these quizzes. No, because the speaking and the writing it's basically you're being evaluated how you speak and how you write. And the only way for you to be assessing your level uh, is when it comes to speaking, you want to listen to yourself speaking. You want to record yourself. After you record yourself, listen again, evaluate how can you improve uh, the flow of ideas, how you say things, the pronunciation, and take notes of those and then target them individually and spend more time on your weakness points. And the third step is the improve. So let's say your level is here. You want to set up a plan to get a little bit better and better and better. Um, and then you want to have faith. Have faith in that the fact that you can improve. Some, unfortunately, some pharmacists, they just give up after a couple of times of them trying to pass so far. They just give up and go back to school to become a physician assistant in the United States, or they just settle to become a pharmacy technician. Um, just have a faith in the process. Again, it's going to take time for you if your level is not already enough to uh, ha have you accomplish the required score. Uh, just have faith in it. In that way, uh, the more you work, the better you will see improvements, and hopefully you will achieve your goal when it comes to TOEFL. A quick, inf uh, quick discussion point is a lot of pharmacists we speak with, they're always upset and mad why they're asking for TOEFL. It's English. What does this has to do with pharmacy? Well, think of it. Uh, if you become here, uh, if you come here and you become a pharmacist, you're standing behind the counter, pe uh, patients, people, they're trusting you. They're trusting your scientific status as a pharmacist and they're trusting you with their health. So the last thing you want to do is not be able to communicate the proper information to a patient just because you have not worked hard to improve your, your language. Um, so it's, it's important, not necessarily just for you to become a pharmacist, but it, it's important for you because once you become a pharmacist, you're going to be put on in a lot of positions where you have to fully express and explain yourself express how uh, medications are going to be taken, uh, express policies, train newcomers, whether they're pharmacy technicians or even managers. Uh, hopefully in a couple of years where you become a pharmacist, you're going to take on a leadership position and then you're going to have to uh, conduct meetings that has 50 people with it. Uh, so obviously the last thing you want to do is not have a proper English when you're speaking with all these people. Uh, so the next step for the FBGE the NAPP uh, on their website, they have a PDF, which is basically uh, a blueprint or a comp what they call a competen uh, competency statement. So the competency statement indicates specific domains that will ask, they will ask you about in the FBGE. And so what, whatever you go and you decide to have as a reference when you're preparing for FBGE, you want to make sure that all these items that's mentioned in the competency statement blueprint that you actually studied and uh, you feel comfortable or, uh, around. When it comes to the references, FBGE is uh, quite tricky. And the reason being is the NAPP does not guide you to a specific book and tell you, oh, read this book, chapters, those, and you'll be good. Um, why? Because the NAPP have what they believe is the domain that every pharmacist needs to know. 
they don't they don't tie you with specific book they just tell you this is what we believe you need to know and no matter whatever you go and get that information from it's up to you uh but as long at the end of the day you you know these uh items in the competences statement the couple of things i want to point out when it comes to references you want to make sure that the reference you're studying is up to date and what i mean by up to date is uh, i picture you now if you go to any uh, social media group and post um what are the references I need to study for FBGE? The first book they everyone is going to mention is the AFA or the American Pharmacists Association for FBGE. So um, interesting. What's interesting enough about the AFA? There's first edition and a second edition. The the gap between the two was ten years. So up till year nine, if you go on Facebook and you ask what to prepare you will find students asking you to study AFA, even though AFA has been nine years old. Uh, and obviously, if you guys studied drug information in pharmacy school, you know it's not a really good idea for you to build your knowledge on something that's nine years old. Specifically, where, because we work in science, there is uh, breakthroughs in science and research on every given day. And uh, the fact that you think what you studied and has been nine years that it's been out there for, it's not really a good idea for you to focus and think that that should be enough. The next book they will tell you about is the CPR or the, or the Comprehensive Pharmacy Review. The most up-to-date edition is the eighth edition for the CPR. And CPR is, um, it's, I think it's 10 years old as well. So, it's, it's really important for you not to dive deep, in, for example, into CPR because a lot of the things it's mentioned in CPR uh, is not become, it's not a good pharmacy practice at this moment. Um, it's a great resource, have a lot of information. AFA is a great book too, whether it's uh, the uh, first or the second edition, but uh, the AFA is gonna just cover a mighty pit of the statement that for the competency it's not gonna dive deeper, so don't count on AFA. Don't count. Don't count on the CPR alone. The reason being is they might not cover everything that in 2021 is considered to be the state of the art pharmacy practice in the country. And then uh, for the CPR as well, the CPR is technically was mostly made for NAPLEX, and NAPLEX is the clinical pharmacy. So then the CPR. It's made out of 1,500 pages. Most of these pages are things that you don't need to know for the FBGE. So just try to focus on what's mentioned in the statement. Obviously, you need the pharmacology. Pharmacology, there's a lot of good books uh, out there that can serve that as well. And then you have the public health domain and the pharmacopedemiology and the calculations and the pharmacokinetics. So especially if you're a fresh graduate, a lot of the notes, a lot of the things you're studying probably now in your pharmacy school and thinking that those might not be something that you need to know because who used them? Guess what? If you make it to take the FBGE, you're gonna need all these notes. So I'd, uh, especially if you're in your home country at this moment and once you immigrate to the United States, do me a favor, a lot of these notes, either scan them in and take them on a flash drive or actually carry in your notebooks with you because they're gonna come in very handy once you start preparing for the FBGE. Third is the NAPLEX. Uh, again, the NAPLEX is the clinical portion of your practice as a pharmacist. Uh, and uh, to a lower percentage, they don't focus on as much on the regulatory part or the operational, but you're expected to know. Uh, and what I mean by that is, again, because you become a pharmacist, you're a leader on day one. So you need to know the law, you need to know how to do things and not break any rules. And when it comes to the operation, you wanna, you, you wanna, have, you wanna have some sort of understanding of how to do uh, certain things within the operation, uh, whether it has to do with the insurances, uh, claims, uh, best practices that's recommended for you to follow while you're working as a pharmacist. 
And this is a general view. Again, in the next sessions, we will be discussing uh, more in depth about uh, these uh, specific domains. So for the FPGE study plan, um, in general, the first, so if you look at the competency statement, you will see that they have uh, multiple items that you want to pay attention to. Uh, the first I, uh, the first domain is the biomedical sciences. The second domain is the pharmaceutical sciences. And the slide here, both of them are in section one, okay? Um, but in the competency statement, they have four domains here. Uh, we have, we crammed them up in three uh, focus areas for it to be a little bit, uh, so it can make sense for you. So in section one, we have the biomedical sciences and the pharmaceutical sciences. So you're looking at everything that has to do with the physiology, pathology, uh, the immune system, and then the pharmaceutical sciences, compounding, sterile compounding, uh, medications, side effects, and uh, obviously the compass statement does better description than uh, the description I'm providing here, but all these are considered or consider them to be the, the first section. Next, we have the social, behavioral, and administrative sciences. And third, we have the clinical sciences. And fourth is the review questions. So at Albertinius, this is our study plan. This is how we approach things. Even though in the competency statement, they have four sections, but obviously the review question is not considered among their uh, competency statement. For section number two, which is the social behavior and administrative sciences, this is considered to be the trickiest part why you're studying for the FPGE. And why is that? Well, when it comes to the physiology, physiology is the same. Whether you study here, China, Egypt, uh, France, Italy, it's the same thing. Right, the human body is the same. Somebody finds out, does research, finds something differently, publishes it online. Everyone knows about it. Everyone adapts to that uh, information. So there's nothing really changes. And whatever you call a specific bone, for example, or a disease, whatever you call it in English, you're gonna come here, most likely they're gonna call it the same thing. So you're not gonna find challenges in that um, department especially if you're a fresh graduate or you're very, uh, very competent with the science and the knowledge. Then we, with the pharmaceutical sciences, for the most part, it's the pharmacology. Uh, Amiodrone is for arrhythmias, whether it's used in Africa, Europe, uh, Asia, or United States. So nothing challenging here either, but um, with the pharmace pharmaceutical sciences, when it comes to the compounding, it's a little bit different because regardless of how things are done outside the United States, in the United States, they have what's known as the USP. And the USP is uh, the body that has all these regulations on how to do the compounding in the United States. So those might be a little bit different for you. Number two, it's, uh, the social and behavior and administrative sciences those are mostly specific for United States. And that's why a lot of students have trouble with, because once you start studying, you went to all of your note, college notes or your university notes, you, stu you studied everything you studied in the five or the six years, right? You're good in pharmacokinetics, you're good in pharmacoeconomics, you're good in everything. But when it comes to public health, you have no idea why, because whatever public health you studied in your pharmacy school outside the United States doesn't necessarily apply to what's happening in the United States or the law is different, or how things are done, or how you treat your patient, or what are the patient rights. All of these things are different in the United States. So regardless of how great you are as a pharmacist outside the United States, section number two is the section that you're gonna have to spend the majority of your time in because it's different. It's something that you don't necessarily, like you haven't studied before. Then three is the clinical sciences. It's basically the same as the pharmaceutical sciences, but everything clinical, everything uh, near the bedside of the patient. And section number four are the review questions. Um, and the reason why we have that recommendation is because if you think you want to study everything you studied in five years, you want to study it in six months or four months, 
and obviously there's you're going to have an information overload or data overload which might not be ideal for some of you guys out there that's why we recommend review questions review questions are awesome because it will allow you to review more right it will make you more comfortable and it will help you with identifying the weakness points that you have and in that way you don't necessarily just overlook things or uh, just keep shoving up information in your brain and then you go to the test and your mind is fried and you cannot answer any of the questions because you studied too much. So once you do the review questions, it makes you more subtle and uh, calmer, especially when you go to the FPG, which is a long test in general. Um, so taking a lot of review questions will help you out in uh, building stamina and tolerance to be able to sit for several hours and take the test all at once. So with this, we came to the conclusion of the session. Um, I'm gonna open the chat back, uh, the chat box now to answer any of the questions that you guys have. If you have any uh, questions that you come up with after this session, please go ahead and send us out an email. Uh, our email is staff at albatinius.com or you can visit us on LinkedIn, Instagram, or Facebook. Um, and now we're gonna just go ahead to the uh, chat box. So the question we've received was, uh, will post bachelor form the degree be counted? The course is three hours after obtaining uh, a bachelor's of pharmacy. Uh, so that's the, the, that's the question. So for the uh, post bachelor form the degree, um, that will, they will ask you for a specific guidelines and uh, basically a breakdown of the credentials that you have uh, and the reason being is what what you have went through in the bachelor's degree in your country might not necessarily fit with their requirements so that's why you want to uh, you want to just check with them but for the most part if it's if you had the degree of farm d or whatever program you enrolled with it turned into a farm d they they might accept, but it's definitely worth the try. But as I said, these cases, uh, the NAPP, they evaluate them case by case. Uh, so the best body to answer that question is gonna be the NAPP. Next, we have any information about the unemployment rate of pharmacy graduates in uh, the US. So when it comes to the employment rate of the pharmacy graduates, um, it depends on where you're looking in the state. So remember we mentioned Texas, Florida, New York, uh, California. So if you meet a pharmacist there, the majority of the pharmacists are gonna tell you, oh, there's a lot of us that are unemployed, which is not technically true. The reason being is the pharmacy job growth is, um, is 0%. And what I mean by that is there's not really a whole lot of pharmacy positions that's newly created in the market. And uh, why is that? So a lot of people read that report as saying, oh, wait a second. So that means nobody's going to work. Not really. Nowadays, with how things are changing in the United States, we have pharmacists take on a whole lot different job titles. Okay. So for example, we have the informatics pharmacist who most of what they do, uh, the work that they uh, on the workplace is IT reports, running data, making sure that the pharma software is functioning right. So these uh, pharmacists, their job titles where they work, for example, it can be a pharmacy analyst. So it's not a pharmacist, but it's a pharmacist job. So if we look at the job, um, the job growth, you're not going to see any growth, but that doesn't mean that there's not opportunities out there. So, but for you as a foreign pharmacy graduate, you want to make sure that you're looking in the right place. For example, Chicago has six different pharmacy schools. Don't expect to go to Chicago and get the pharm a pharmacy job on your first day. I know some pharmacists who have been in Chicago for a year and they still couldn't find a job. Why? because the area of Chicago has six different pharmacy schools. So these schools give out to the employers enough the, uh, supply of pharmacists. 
So you standing trying to uh, battle up with people who've been going to pharmacy school in the United States, it's hard. But that doesn't necessarily mean that instead of you looking in Chicago, going somewhere in South Illinois and not finding a job. So you want to be aware uh, of where you're specifically looking. Uh, okay, so we don't have any further questions for now. Uh, again, if you have any questions after we finish the session, please go ahead and uh, send us an email to staff at albatinos.com. Uh, we'll hope you guys enjoy uh, a good week ahead of you. And uh, thank you for um, joining me today. Have a good day, everyone.